Sam Feifel, your very hot and sweaty host of John Updike's Ghost, your favorite podcast about reading, writing, bookstores, all things awesome and hot summer weather. I am joined, as always, by my co-host, the co-owner of the Bookshop of Beverly Farms, my sister and all-around great person, Hannah Harlow. How are you doing, Hannah? Also so hot. It's so hot. It's too hot, really. It is too hot. I'm sad that we're not still up at the lake where we can just jump into the water whenever we like. I know. It was very good uh, reading July 4th week. I think everybody was just crushing pages on the dock. It Uh, was great. I read a book in a day. Wow. I read another, almost a whole book in a day. Um, Yeah, it felt really good to just uh, crush some books. Yeah. I would have read a book in a day, except the book I was reading was like a thousand pages. We'll get to that. That was a challenge. Uh, it was very nice. Also, we, you know, I, I should not surprise anybody that we have a very literary family. But uh, for those people who think that only uh, children only consume their media on devices, we'd had just about every single child reading a book at one point or another, just about every day. So that went pretty That's good. That's true. My younger son was very happy. He had books that he liked. My older son forgot his book and said, mom, find me a book. So I was perusing our shelves. Like we have some books up at the camp. They're not, I don't, he's, you know, a teenager. Right. He wanted sci-fi fantasy and it seemed he'd read every sci-fi book we had there. No, so he had read the him. half bad series and everything. Oh yeah. He loved that series. Oh yeah. And then I said, how about a mystery? So I, found him a mystery that he's like he kind of got into it's it's ellie griffith's the crossing places which i love which i think oh i read that book yeah yeah it's a good one it's kind of like a cozy mystery with a side of uh, weird english countryside exactly (laughs) that's good uh i saw max uh who is 11 12 right Uh, yeah he's 12 He, he was reading some like slasher mystery that mom had bought last year or something oh, wow. that was like that woman she's like easter bas, 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 you know like it's like, like a, Icelandic or something yeah whatever and at one point max goes this is pretty gruesome yikes <laughs> like, i'm so glad we just gave that to a 12 year old that's great super i don't know i talk about i have a friend i talk about this with all the time that she you know said she grew up in a house where her Parents just had wall, like this big wall of books. Yeah, same and, as us. Right, same as us. And she would just, there was no whatever. Like she would just go pick a book out. And yeah. we would do the same. And sometimes it was inappropriate. And it was sure. Like, oh, well, whatever. Too bad. Yeah. No, I don't really, yeah. it doesn't really worry me at all. It's just. You know. And I actually wish my kids would do that more. I feel like they don't just wander up to the wall of books and pick one out. They're like. Yeah, that doesn't really happen in my yeah. household. Uh, Ruby will do that then. Not really Pedro. Hmm. Um, all right. We yeah. should get to our agenda because I know we have a lot. We have a lot of books, of books to talk about. We have about. a lot of books because we, uh, I have three books. I have, uh, they're all brand new. Basically I have, uh, Hallie Butler's brand new banal nightmare, which I gave a little tease of, uh, last pod. I have, uh, Hanif uh, there's always this year, a uh, book of wow, essays. You read that already? Uh, I'm like half done with it, enough to talk Ooh. about it, I think. Okay. And then I have Lev Grossman's The Bright Sword, which is the, uh, it had to have been a thousand pages. It went At on least. for a very long time. Um, and that brick. comes out either this week or next week as well. So they're all either just on the shelves or coming out next week. What three books do you have? Cool. I have One of Our Kind by Nicola Yoon. I have The Guide by Peter Heller. Mm. And I have Trust Her by Flynn Berry. Mm. Let's start with The Guide, because I think, didn't you pick that up at I want to start with The Guide. Right, that was a camp book. Because I want to start with something I, like, really loved. And I'm You really loved it. Really, I really loved this book. You did seem to be into it on the dock. You know, I brought, 
maybe six books up with me because I wasn't sure what I'd want to read. And there are all these galleys of, you know, forthcoming books that I feel like I want and need to read. Yes. But I got up to camp and because I was looking on the shelf, on the shelves for my 15 year old, I pulled out from the camp shelf, the guide by Peter Heller. And I was sort of looking at it like, oh, maybe Huck would like this. But then I started reading the first page and I was like, oh, wait, this looks really good. And so I ended up like I just ended up reading it. And I so it was like this awesome, like kind of one of those magical discoveries of like you just happen upon this book. Right. And I read it in a day like the writing is so insanely beautiful. I know we've talked about this where like, you know, that's pretty high praise. So insanely beautiful. Yeah. Okay. But it, also, but it also has like this propulsive plot and it's like this taut action thriller. Yeah. But what I, so I, so I loved that because it is beautiful writing plus action, whatever. Like, I think that's kind of like the magical, whatever yeah. formula. You can nail that. You're doing pretty good. Um, but what made the language so great was the guide is um, this young man in Colorado who has just gotten a new job as a fishing guide at this like high end luxury lodge. Mm -hmm. And it's set in, I think he wrote it in 2021. So I think COVID had kind of was happening. Oh, really? For some reason I thought it was older than that. I know. I thought he had kind of, I thought it was a little bit more prescient, but I'm not sure it was (laughs) because in the, in the book there've been, uh, there's like a virus and now it's mutating and there are all these new, strains and you know lots of people have died and so everyone is kind of social distancing and wearing masks and so it had a it had a very covidy vibe but it was not covid necessarily right and so all the rich people now go to these like wilderness resorts for vacation to kind of get away from the cities where everyone's getting sick yeah So he is, so this guide shows up first day, kind of mid season because the previous guide has mysteriously left his post. Mysteriously. Well, he doesn't, you know, he's the, you know, the management's like, oh, it didn't work out, but Mm -hmm. we will soon learn that, you know, things got fishy. Right. Yeah. Oh, fishy. Yes. I didn't even do that on purpose. I'm sure. Um, But so, you know, we've talked about how a lot of books are about writers because writers are just writing about what they know or Mm -hmm. whatever. Right. This was about a fisherman and the language was so specific to fishing and like the flies they use. Oh, really? Was that, that's what I was about to ask. It's one of like, when people start talking about like fly tying, yeah, that it might be the single most boring subject. I can imagine. It wasn't boring. Like it was so good. Cause it wasn't, he didn't like, get too into it it was just like a few words right but they were like these this great combination of words where like i wouldn't think of putting those together and i don't even know what some of those are but like it's about the fly or you know that was just great yeah uh is it a sequel to the river it is a sequel to the river okay i didn't know they seem like similar titles but i didn't know if they were actually right so in the guy, there are all these allusions to him losing his best friend. Oh, and that happened in the river? And that happened in the river. Gotcha. And actually, now I, pro- I, I was just thinking, oh, I really want to read the river. But then I'm like, but I know what happens because they tell you enough. Yeah. Well, the guide. Yeah. I think I don't mind. Like, I think I would. It like probably it. wouldn't bother you. I don't think. Yeah. Um, and he has a new book coming out, too, right? Burn yes. or something like that? Did so, you read Burn? I can't remember. I fell in. No, I haven't read it. Now I really want to read it. So his last book, The Last Ranger, just came out in paperback. Oh, that's what I saw. Yeah, that yeah, came out like he, last week. Yeah. He yeah. has a new book coming out. Maybe not until the fall. I should have. So it's like August 13th. Set, oh, okay. Yeah. So that book is set in Maine. Like two. Burn is? Yeah. Two guys have gone camping in like Acadia or whatever. And they, they like left their phones at home. You know, they've just gone totally off the grid oh wow come out after they emerged weeks. from the woods of yeah. rural maine to a dystopian country racked by bewildering violence yeah oh my goodness gracious that so i feel scary. like he had you know i've read i read another book by him and i would say he's 
he's on theme. He has things he kind of keeps coming back to, like yeah. a slightly dystopian future. There's some violence. There, rural nature. stuff. Yeah, I'm uh, into it. I am yeah, now it, like, it, let the, me read more. Well, like when they pimp him, it says the best-selling author of the Dog Stars. Oh yeah, sorry, that's I don't even I know of. Oh really? I read the Dog Stars. Oh, that's 2013. And I so I read the Dog Stars. I'd heard so many good things about it. I know a bunch of people who really loved it, and I read, I read the whole thing three quarters of the way through. I was like, I really don't think I like this book. Like I just found it like really depressed. You know, it's it is set in a dystopian future where uh, like, almost yeah. everybody has died. Oh, so yeah. this guy's living on his own, just kind of like scavenging. And he's befriended one other guy, you know, and there's basically no one else around. They kind of know of like one other community. Um, the, the main character can fly. So he's like, oh. he flies this little prop plane around. <laughs> he can fly. Know, he, yeah. I mean, sorry, he, He's a pilot. Oh, he's a pilot. I was like, no, he's not like, there's no magic. Sorry. No. (laughs) Um, That's a plot twist. But a lot of that is about like, can we trust like our fellow human? Right. Right. Like so many people have let him down. Like he's run into so many, not so many, but like the few people he's kind of run into in these years of like, there aren't many people left. Like everybody's just out for themselves. Like they're kind of cruel to each other. Right. There's a lot of violence that he's experienced. Yeah. Anyway, I got to the end of that book and the last, whatever last 50 pages were so insanely good and beautiful that I ended up loving the book. Oh, like wow. it made, it made the rest of the book worth it to read that ending. Yeah, I feel like I would like that stuff. So I should maybe I'll. I think, I we, think you we, would like it. We have some Peter Heller in the house, you know. So you I'll should read him. him. I think yeah. you'd like him. I, I I had him confused with whoever wrote that Raft of Stars that I read. I can't remember. Oh yeah, what is? Raft? I thought that was a Peter Heller book, but it wasn't. Um, but it's kind of a similar deal where they're on a raft in a river. Oh yeah, that's. Andrew Graff. I read yeah. that book too. Right. Yeah. I mean, that was pretty good, but no, I know so, but it's different. that was more of like a kids middle school book. Um, so let's see, uh, for a transition, you are talking about dystopian future. I will talk about distant past, um, sure. which is the magical realm of King Arthur, which is the setting of the brand new comes out either this week or next week. Uh, Lev Grossman book, the Bright Sword, which uh, refers indeed to Excalibur. Uh, one of the things that you'll be reminded of in this book, which plays with the Arthurian red legend, is that Excalibur and the sword in the stone are not the same sword. What? Uh, uh, yeah, Excalibur is the one that the lady in the lake... Oh, yeah. Right. King Arthur, who was already king, he just took the sword out of the stone, which is a boring old sword, Um, to prove that he was king, but that was not actually like the magical glowing sword, Mm. which is uh, his caliber, which is, you know, one of the ridiculous things that Lev Grossman does a great job of playing with over the course of a thousand pages of Arthurian legend. And so the conceit of the book is that uh, we are at the end of the Arthurian reign. Arthur has died. And uh, a plucky hedge knight, uh, or actually not even a knight yet, just good fighter dude from Northern England has uh, decided to venture to King Arthur's court to become a member of the round table. But he gets there to discover Arthur's dead. All the knights of the round table just got their ass kicked. There's only like five knights left. And, you know... The sort of tale picks up from there. and We get, you know, Guinevere still kicking around and Morgan Le Fay and the fairies are big characters and Lancelot's around. And there's some like cool minor knights that have minor stories in the Arthurian legend and they get to have like a more, you know, extensive story. And, you know, it, Lev Grossman does his thing like he did in The Magicians, which is he takes you know, a uh, setting that is often treated like very preciously with like, you know, 
oh, like something on Harry Potter where you have this sense of wonder, right? With the magicians, it's the exact opposite. It's this like pervading sense of cynicism and like everything is shit. And, you know, with the uh, King Arthur very legend. Very Gen X. Very Gen X. This is very Gen X too. Uh, so he's taking the King Arthur legend and then he just makes them all talk like they're just contemporary, you know, Gen X people, you know, lots of cynicism and little cutting jabs and ironic asides and, you know, things that are funny. Get to see King Arthur in flashback, right? King Arthur. Yeah. There's tons of flashbacks. So you get, uh, he, he like takes another swing at a lot of the, like how Arthur pulled it out of the stone, what was going on or how, you know, like, so a lot of these legends that, you know, well, if you've read all the King Arthur stuff, um, so he's taking it bold. So it, it, there's like uh, a serious reverence for the source material. He's not mocking people who love King Arthur at all. Um, he's definitely like, this is cool. I love this setting. Um, he's also uh, like integrating all of this like English history. Like, so the Picts and the angles and the, you know, all the different peoples and the Romans have just left and, um, there's, so there's lots of cool sort of historical illusions. There's cool, like period technology, like how they made things back then, you know, he's clearly playing with and, um, but then he admits at the end, like any Arthurian, you know, writer, you have to like cheat because like if King Arthur was really in the time period that they say he was, he wouldn't have had armor. He wouldn't have had like iron swords, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff, you know? Yeah. So he's like, yeah, but there's obviously. there's like some magic, right? Yeah, I mean, there's this, it's just the magic of the Arthurian legend, right? And okay. so like, and um, what Lev Grossman does really well, just like he did in The Magicians, is he makes that magic commonplace to the people who experience it. And so it's not like, you can do special magic, you know? It's like, you know, Bedivere, who's like, you know, Arthur's body man or whatever. And now is kind of leading this ragtag crew, right? You know, he looked around and realized, oh no, you know, I'm in an adventure. And like, that means like the rules are suspended and now, you know, anything might happen. And like, oh, is that due to fairy? He might be a fairy or, you know. Um, so they kind of are like very self-aware when they're in the magical period. And I loved it. Like I couldn't put it down. I read it and read it and read it. Uh, but it's very long, and so there's multiple times where I was like, "Really, this isn't the end? Like, what is it?" You <laughs> so know? the internet tells me it's only 688 pages. Well, is, I don't know. The, <laughs> you know, the galley might have been bigger. You know, it felt bigger than that. it was just a brick. You know, um, <laughs> but you know, it, it didn't drag. It's just, it was just one of those you things. Read it like, fast, huh? Read, you read, read it like fast. Three or four days, yeah. But it's just like, it was one of those things where I was just like, oh, wow, he's got more on this topic. Okay, that's interesting. You know, like, yes. oh, that could have been done, I guess. I also could have been two books. I don't, you know, he had just finished a trilogy with the magicians or whatever. I'm kind of surprised he didn't try to drag this into a couple books. Does this seem like it's a standalone? Or you yeah, I don't think, oh. I don't think there's anything else to talk about. Uh, cool. at the end I mean, it. I kind of like, I mean, yeah, I'm sort of happy about a standalone here and there. Yeah, no, it's fine. And you know, it works as a standalone, you, you know, you, you certainly don't feel cheated. There's no cliffhanger. There's no, you know, uh, I, I, I actually really like that. I, I don't know why I'm not more enthusiastic about it. Like, I think you have to be, I, I, I think the style of humor and this, like the cynicism of Gen X is going more and more out of style. And so you totally. see it less and less and less. And so it starts to be more and more jarring, you know, like, ripping yeah. on each other or, you know, people just dying willy nilly. You're just like a little bit more sensitive to it nowadays. Like, Oh, I guess we just killed right. that guy. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. Everybody seems a lot more earnest these days. Yes. Which I'm fine with. I'm, you know, yeah. the, the, especially in the political sphere, like the constant skepticism, cynicism, you know, pessimism doesn't help anybody. Right. Um, and like slacker culture, I don't think has produced uh, great artistic no. merits necessarily. <laughs> so, but I think, you know, Lev's a throwback. He's like our age. He clearly yeah. enjoyed all that. Sort of, so, you know, I, I think if you're a Lev Grossman fan, you'll love this book. Right. Um, I'm a Lev Grossman fan. Like I've yeah. loved a lot of his books. I'm still planning on reading this one. I think I would like it, but I think, yeah, if, you know, you haven't read them before, you might go in with a little bit of. Yeah. And it's like, you know, if you don't like 
magic or, you know, like it's not even just magic, like the Arthurian legend stuff. It's all like kind of like cutesy, you know, like, oh, yeah. his arms are, uh, you know, three castles on a field of green with stars, you know, and like <laughs> you have to care about right. that shit and be able to totally. envision it in your brain and that kind of stuff. And I can see why people would be like, this is stupid, but yeah. I liked it. Cool. Um, I'm going to have a tough transition here. What? So. Come on. <laughs> I'm going to go, I just want to go in the order of like how much I liked the book. Okay. So next up, ne- second next best. Book <laughs> is Trust Her by Flynn Berry. Uh-huh. So Flynn Berry wrote a book called Northern Spy that came out yeah, in 2021. You, you read that. And I really liked that. Yeah, yeah, I liked it a lot. And it was a Reese Witherspoon book club pick. It was a bestseller. Mm-hmm. You know, it was, had a solid outing. Um, and th- in that book, it's about like the main character, like basically just got divorced, has a newborn and her sister, she discovers has been in the IRA secretly. Oh yeah. That's right. 10 years, yeah, but I now remember. has since turned informant to MI5 and like ropes her sister into like being an informant with her yeah. sketch. Yeah. Super sketch. Um, but it was just great. One of the things I loved about that book was I just thought she did a really good job of balancing like the thriller spy stuff with being this new mom and having right. an Domest- domesticity yeah. and, you know, contrast. Yeah. I like yes. that too. So this is a sequel oh. and I really don't know how much you would like it if you hadn't read that first book. So you're back with the sisters. They've now been relocated to Dublin. Her son is now five, I think. Mm. So it's like four years later. Yeah. And I actually found some of the domesticity stuff like a little too much this time where I was like, yeah, I don't need to hear like another cute thing your son said. Like that has no relevance to the book. So like I got a little annoyed with some of that stuff. (laughs) And then the thriller stuff, I just felt like it took a little too long to really pick up. Like the second half of the book was great. You know, I was like good pacing. Good pacing. I couldn't wait to figure out what happened. I just found it a little difficult to get into it. And I was sort of like, why are we here again? You know, I just didn't. I didn't totally see the need for a sequel. Um, right. And what's so, the title again? The title is like so forgettable. Trust her. Trust her. Yeah. I know. It's like, does not, it not doesn't the best roll title. off the tongue. Trust her. Like, right. is it one word or two? You know, it's just. Like... <laughs> <laughs> so ultimately, it's about I'm a trust the, her. Si- the sister's relationship, right? Like her sister, there's a lot of talk. Like, you know, she's talking to her ex husband, and her ex husband's like, you know, why can't you forgive me for cheating on you when you could forgive your sister for like being in the IRA, be like being a terrorist and killing yes. people? Same, same, I guess. Yeah. And she's like, well, she's my sister. And so, you know, you get to the end of the book and it's like, do you trust, can she trust her sister mm. or does she trust like, you know, everybody else? Right. So, okay. So, yeah. Yeah, but all right. the title yeah. kind of tells you the answer already. So that's why right. I really love the title. You should, you should trust her. You should trust her. Or maybe you shouldn't. I don't know. Yeah, Who's, don't and know. Who, is, who is making this commandment? Is it God? <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, I just, it was a little, there was a little like weirdness going on. So it wasn't a slam dunk, but I did, like it wasn't enjoyable. Yeah. Either. Especially if you like Northern Spy, takes you back to the universe. Yes, absolutely. All uh-huh. right. Okay. Um, a book that I loved. So oh, I don't know right. it, the order or whatever. I think I liked this more than the bright sword. Actually, this, I, this is an early pick for my favorite Ooh, book. I'm not wow. just going to say it's the best, but my favorite. It's currently book. in the running for a top 10 of these. Currently in the running. Uh, again, it's by Hallie Butler. We went through her bio on the last pod, but she's, a um, you know, She has recently been one of Granta's uh, five under 35 or National Book Foundation's five under 35, too. Um, So maybe she's 36 now or seven. I don't know. But um, she uh, this book is I think in the last book I said it was New York, but it's actually about Chicago. So it is um, this art student moves with her also art boyfriend to Chicago to like be an art couple. Um, she's from her hometown. So the first part of the book is 
her breaking up with her loser art boyfriend, moving back to her, you know, suburban hometown where her high school friends or high school non-friends still have jobs. And then there's this little, like some sort of, you know, it's like Brunswick or someplace like that, that has like a boat in college or, you know, like a small town that has, what? But outside I actually, Chicago? it just says Midwest. It doesn't give oh. us a town for her. And like, okay. it just says the town is called X because like, it's like every small town, I guess. Got but it. there is a small college where some of her high school friends work. And that's like kind of the, the setting at times is on this little college mm-hmm. campus because, um, you know, one of the plot lines is one of her friends decides that she wants to you know, have a visiting artist program at this little small college. So brings in this artist who's kind of a big timer and she's an art student and they kind of like interact. But the, the, so what I love about this book is the plot is completely irrelevant. There's, I mean, there is like sort of this little plot of like, you know, she's, can she make her way in her little hometown? But in general, it's just about she and all of her friends and everybody in suburban life are like complete and total train wreck disasters and like constantly. So most of it's this, the main character is Madi is her name, M O D D Y, you know? Um, and, uh, she just like, is this walking disaster? Like, you know, constantly, you know, anxious, you know, regretting her boyfriend breakup, you know, kind of wanting him back, but hating herself for wanting it back. So that she, goes and smokes a shit ton of weed and like, you know, drinks a whole bunch and like goes to this party as like, you know, I can't talk to anybody and it's like completely inappropriate and like calls people out and is mean to them. And then like regrets it later and then tries to convince herself to be a good person. And then, and so then right when you're like, do I like this person or not like this person? What am I supposed to do? the perspectives start like bleeding in the scenes. And so to like bleed from her perspective into the perspective of like one of her, like, you know, high school friends or whatever. And then you start getting their interior and like, you know, all of the relationships are terrible. And it's like, if, you know, every situation, everybody involved was like the worst person you can imagine. And they like had these hilarious, like mean spirited opinions about the people that they were with, you know? And so like, you'll get like this really like, you know, bane all exactly interaction of like this couple, you know, making dinner. And then the interior monologue of both of them is like, I can't wait to leave this loser. I hate him. His stupid job <laughs> sucks. You know, it's holding me back and blah, blah, blah. But then they're all like so delusional and you can see how delusional they are. And so like, you don't, you know, you're like, Oh my God, this person is like on crack. And, you know, and it's, I laughed out loud like 50 times because they're wow. just, and it is, it's definitely, you know, it's set as like millennial, because, you know, everybody is either, you know, everybody is like in their thirties, young thirties, or like they have young kids, if they have kids, you know, a lot of them don't have kids yet. Um, and so they're like, you know, the beginning of their careers and this sort of, but the humor is very Gen X. It's like, just, just mean, absolute mean. And then just, <laughs> but also just like, um, you know, a lot, you know, I feel like drugs and alcohol have gone out of style, you know? Totally. And yes. so this, this is all just about like, why am I drinking? Why am I smoking this weed? Where do I get more drugs? Like stumbling, falling down, you know, waking up super hungover. It's just, is it super awkward at times? Like, are you oh, it's so it like, awkward. There's so, awkward. yeah. Like, you know, it's, it's so like Madi, especially she's like, just hates herself for being nice to people and but say so it's it's actually so that there is this big i don't know if i should reveal i'm not going to reveal like there's this, there's this pretty significant pivot like midway mm-hmm. through the book where like she finally like is like super honest or whatever about a situation instead of being cynical and self-loathing and all this sort of stuff and like at the end it's she's just like so like embarrassed but then this woman is like very kind to her and like helps her out and you know and so then like the book does sort of turn but it, it it's not um uh, it's very it's not like in your face about it but it, it does kind of come around to this like oh like maybe friendships are valuable like maybe you know like 
not every relationship has to be transactional. Maybe, you know, like it. Yeah. And so there is like this little glimmer of hope that I think we're supposed to get, but it just ends. Like, you know, there's no like climax or whatever. It just yeah. kind of goes and you keep thinking like, Oh, is she going to get together with this guy? No. Is she going to get this <laughs> job? No. Is she, <laughs> like, is, is she going to find redemption? No. <laughs> it's just like, you know, so it's great. Like there, it doesn't, it never makes you like, it never like gives you this big thing like, Oh, everything's going to be all right. But you do like, it's not so cynical that you're like, Oh, all these people are fucking awful. You know, like, you, right. like oh, maybe there, maybe it won't be. Maybe there's a little hope. Yeah. Tell us the title again. Yeah. Banal nightmare, banal nightmare by Hallie Butler. Uh, yeah. I really don't like the cover. I hope they'd pick a different cover, but, um, it's just really funny. It's really fun. And right. like the woman at the center, Madi is, just really believable. And it's great to have like a protagonist that just has no heroic qualities at all. Like she has no good qualities, zero. <laughs> um, but she's okay. still like somewhat likable. I don't, it's, it's very, are her parents like in the book? She... Uh, yeah. She, well, you know, she talks about her, her parents have moved somewhere else. Like oh, she okay. kind of goes, you know, to visit them a couple of times. Yeah. And, um, cool. It yeah. sounds great. It made me want to read it. It's really good. It's really funny. Big fan. Cool. All right. So the last book I have to talk about, I'm like struggling to figure out how to talk about it. Um, <laughs> so it's called One of Our Kind. It's uh -huh. by Nicola Yoon. I believe mm -hmm. this is her adult debut. She's a really, you know, celebrated YA author. She is. OK. Um, she's written a bunch of YA books. She's, you know, in she's been a national book award finalist. She was the first black woman to hit number one on the New York times YA bestseller list. Oh, really? She's won a bunch of awards for her YA books. Um, so in this book, which is on everything, our, everything and sun yeah. is also a star instructions okay. for dancing. Yeah, the sun yeah, is also yeah. a star was like a big book. Okay. All right. I know this, I, this one got by my radar. So well, I see you invested. We bought, we took six of these, one of our kind books in. So, yeah, well, <laughs> I don't think we've sold one yet. No, since June so 11th. Yeah. I actually, well, I listened to this and one of the reasons I listened to it, because yeah, we have six copies on the shelf and I thought, well, I need to be able to talk about this and right. sell it. You thought and it was now I'm going to have a hard time. Like, so first of all, I found it like incredibly predictable. Like I, you start reading it and you know mm. exactly what's going to happen. I don't like it. Like, I don't like yeah. it. I'm like, okay, I'm just like waiting. Like I know what's going to happen. And so this, like this, I mean, someone described it as a slow burn thriller. And I was like, yeah, slow burn. Like, <laughs> but we know what's going to, like we, it's, it's totally inevitable as the reader, you know, like where the evil's coming from and you're waiting for the character to, figure it out. Mm. Um, so the, the setup is this young family, you know, mom, dad, and young son with baby number two on the way, uh -huh. move to this town called Liberty that is all black. Okay. Right. So they're a black family and they're finally going to like have this like feeling of security and safety and not having to look over their shoulders right, yeah, hey, have to like no whiteies like, around to bother right. us. Yeah. The police are black. Like they're sending their kids. <laughs> That'll solve all the problems. Well, it helps. We know it's not going to solve all the problems, but um, their kid goes to a school where every teacher at the school is black. Right. Great. Like, yeah. Super. Yeah. So seems amazing. Yeah. But I mean, it yeah. can't, it's obviously can't be amazing. Like, right. I mean, yeah. Um, so there's no one would actually think it would be amazing to have like this all black town. There's a little Stepford Wives feeling already yeah. going into it. Um, there are definitely some like weirdos. And so she is a public defender mm -hmm. and like kind of this social just, you know, she believes in like giving right. back to her community and mm -hmm. whatever. And so she gets there and immediately like she meets these people who, you know, don't really care that there's been another shooting of a black man by a police officer yeah, yeah, I live in someone, black town. Um, yeah. around Los Angeles. Right. So she's kind of like, wait, what the, you know? And so the one of our kind kind of references, like, like at some point, you know, she's like, Oh, I, you know, people think all black people are the same, but like, right. obviously there's mm -hmm. a wide variety of 
you know, <laughs> beliefs and personalities yes, and like exactly. whatever. Yes. Um, the whole point of uh, anti-racism is that we don't see the black population as a monolith. Right. Yes. And, but it was, it reminded me a lot of the book, The Other Black Girl, which is. Oh, well, the description says yeah. for fans of The Other Black Girl. So. I mean, it is, it's like basically the same exact story <laughs> where there's like clearly some supernatural force kind of changing black people into ah. like not fighting uh, racism in the way that you would expect them to. Uh -huh. um, it also reminded me of um, how I felt when I finished watching the black Panther where like, and this is why I'm going to struggle to talk because oh. I am a white person. Okay. Like I I've don't noticed. obviously t totally know what I'm talking about here, but mm -hmm. when I'm watching these stories and then the, there's a black person, that's the bad guy. And I'm like, I want there to be the, I want a white person to be the bad guy. <laughs> yeah, maybe that would just make it easier. <laughs> I think that's maybe a little too on the nose. You know? Yeah. Um, so, you know, going in, like you're reading this and you're like, okay, you know, <laughs> you know who the bad guys are. The one thing you don't know is just why. Right. So you were like, right. you get to the last chapter and the experience. Here's the big reveal. Here's this the big reveal. Why. why they're doing it. And you actually, by that point, you can even see that coming. Right. Um, but I just, you know, I found the why a little unsatisfying. Um, mm -hmm. But I just think, I don't know, like, I, you know, it's just like. I Will the truth destroy her world before. in ways she never could have imagined? I mean, yes, it will. Uh, uh, it's <laughs> described also as a daring satire. Do you think it's, does it work as satire? What is it satirizing? Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, I don't think people really understand what satire means. I don't think people understand what satire is either. I mean, well, what is like Stepford Wives satirizing? Like uh, satirizing, the, you know, the, classic fifties culture, right? Yes. So, so it's yeah. satirizing like this idea that we can suburbanize our way out of racism. If we just make all the black people rich, we're good. Yeah, maybe. I mean, that's definitely worth satirizing. There's, I, I think that's garbage, you know, like right. making sure that black people benefit from capitalism does not solve racism. Yeah, I mean, like what's ultimately happening, like, right. I mean, I just. Right. I don't know. I don't know. Doesn't move the needle for you. It did. It just didn't. I appreciate what she's attempting to do, which is just expand the conversation about racism and how we fight it and what it means to everybody involved. Mm -hmm. I just think the execution was like a little heavy handed, heavy handed and just not new. There was not like it didn't have a the, the story itself. Right. The like. Right. Wasn't fresh. But she's an excellent writer, right? Like she's like it's like a very competently told story. It's just ultimately yeah. a story of not a not a new story for you yeah. anyway. Yeah. Uh what's interesting is good transition to uh there's always this year on basketball and ascension by Hanif Adurakib. Uh he also wrote uh Little Devil in America, um prolific essayist, I would say. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, no, writes for the New Yorker. Mm -hmm. um, I follow him on Instagram where I enjoy yeah. his posts. And so uh, Goss and I, my son, are still high on the Celtics championship. So this was yes. an excellent uh, birthday present I got. When, I think this was Kristen went to DDG. I don't know if that's one, I'm pretty sure. She did. Yeah. Your wife got it for you. Yeah, um, I knew that for sure. It was just, yeah, I just, when I say I think, it means you know, I know for sure. Um, and, uh, it's a great choice. Um, he's an excellent writer. You know, he is the sort of writer that, um, uh, is, you know, it's right on the, I would say it's right on the edge of like spoken word poetry. There's a lot, you know, it's broken up into a lot of 
uh, small sort of paragraphs that begin and end sort of in the middle of thoughts sometimes or connect into the next paragraph in, in a cool little transition. Uh, he organizes it like a basketball clock. So it's like a count. Each chapter is like a countdown from like oh. 15 or 12. I mean, 10, eight, seven, there's like different time signatures that are, I don't know if they're meant to be important or not, but they're sort of fun little interludes. Um, there's a lot of like, you know, just, it's just where it's very, uh, stream of consciousness, uh, while still being sort of organized. It's this sort of riff on, um, uh, how basketball plays a role in black culture. And so there's a lot of other black culture sort of riffs, like, you know, the, the haircut in black culture or the, the shaved head in black culture, or, you know, the baggy shorts that the fab five of Michigan, you know, university basketball, in the nineties, like turned into black culture. And, you know, the, superstars from your hood. He grew up in Columbus, which, you know, became this basketball hotbed. And he was in high school when uh, LeBron James was in high school in Akron, like a couple high schools over. And so there's this whole riff on just like what it meant for, you know, black culture to have these heroes that would get wealthy with basketball. And, but we follow some of them as they fall and just a really, just a, a beautiful lyrical writer, like very musical writer. Um, He is a poet. I I don't know if you actually said that he has books of poetry. Right. Yeah. Like even his prose is, you know, it's not, uh, it kind of, you know, bends back on itself a lot. He'll like revisit themes, you know, he kind of comes at things sideways. There's like a whole section on, he got game the movie and you know how that played out for him. And um, so it's very personal, like it also just gets into a lot of like fathers and sons and, you know, family relations and prison and, you know, just all of these different things that have entered his life. But, you know, it kind of keeps coming back to this basketball lens, even, you know, and, you know, it's sometimes it's and just like very... being a fan, right? Like being a fan of the game and not as much not being much. a fan. Oh. No, it's more. And that that's the thing It's like, um, you know, I would say that there are, there's this big spectrum of like basketball interaction and enjoyment, right? So there's people who play the game. There's people who are just fans of the game. There are people who make the game, their career that, you know, like, it's more of like basketball as a cultural phenomenon and oh, cool. like, you know, how, you know, like he talks a lot about, uh, there's this great section on like during the pandemic, he would go and like shoot hoops by himself until like the city took down all the basketball hoops so that kids mm-hmm. wouldn't be able to play basketball. And he's like, you know, it's just take it away from me. So it's like, you know, just that, you know, this, uh, this idea that, you know, it's part of your life, you know, it's not like, you don't root for the Celtics, like basketball is part of your life and your team is this. And, um, you bleed green. Yeah. It's just even, I, I don't know. It's, it's very well done. Um, I read a few pages, um, a little while ago and I, I agree. I mean, like it was just so beautiful. Like his writing, like, I mean, like any, writing by a poet i'm always like oh yes like yeah very the words they choose words are on and, purpose yeah, right but i also think it's interesting because you know it's also not structured like any sort of persuasive essay like i'm not it, it, it's not like he's trying to convince me of something it's not like you know there is this like building argument to a point and then we move on to the next chapter it's really just like these sort of thought exercises yeah you know um yes and, and so it is very personal. Like I just, there was a lot yeah. of stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's Sitting his at the story, you know, table with his, his brothers, his yeah. family, his neighborhood, his, you know, and so there's definitely always part of me is like, oh, why do I care about this guy? Like, I, you know, but I think he's a good enough writer that I, 
I don't even really care what he's telling me. I'm just, right. you know, I'm just sort of I'm just sort of happy to read whatever. Yeah, he I might get three pages about. done. I don't know yeah. what the hell just happened, or who cares? You know, but it's just very enjoyable. It's more, it's much more like listening to music than it is like reading a book. Yes, like and I think you know, I read my few pages, and I was sort of like, oh, th- this was actually a little bit denser than I was thinking it was going to be. Like. Just, it's not easy reading. It's not easy reading. No, 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 no. Not but like, I loved what I read. Um, but yeah, I just thought, oh, I'm, I'm going to need to like invest a little bit more time. In yeah, and it's culture. also yeah. in like, you know, there's a little bit of like Black American patois in there. You know, like he uses slang in, you know, right, in, right amongst like very literature, very literary sentences and stuff, you know, like so it, you also kind of you know, you get a fee. I think he's, I think he's sort of introducing you to his culture, you know? Yeah. I mean, I've been really interested to watch this book come out. He is this indie darling. Um, he kind of started out publishing with like indie presses, uh, especially like the poetry and he's kind of, you know, now reached, he hit this threshold at some point and now he's published by Penguin Random House. He writes for the New Yorker. Uh, He's got a MacArthur grant. He's got a MacArthur grant, like, but he's still what I love, you know, I love that he's still so appreciative of his roots and where he came from. Um, he still gives back to the kind of the indie community. And you, I really saw like indie bookstores, like latch on to this new book and be like, okay, like we're going to get behind this and we still support him and like believe in him and like want to be, you know, part of his career, yeah. which I think is really cool. Um, he, it is. He came to a bunch of the, um, he was at Winter Institute, the American Bookseller Association. Oh, really? This year? The big trade show. Yeah, he was, I mean, that, he was there. Oh, yeah, because it was in Ohio. It was in Cleveland. So It was in Cleveland. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, first, yeah. he did this event with like the indie presses kind of right, they kind of met right before the Winter Institute started. And um, he gave like a speech or something. And then he did an event at an indie bookstore kind of the night before the show started, which I landed too late to make. Uh, And then he was, he just went to the, it was called, it's called the author reception, which is just a big giant room with authors tables and they're signing copies of their books. And his signing line was so long. (laughs) It was the longest one. It was like, you know, 80 people deep at least when I walked by and Actually, I still have the galley downstairs, which is how I read a few pages. And I will go back to it at some point. But I was walking by the signing line and one of the staffers working the line was like, do you just want an ARC if you don't want to wait in the line? And I was like, yeah, I don't I don't need it. I mean, I'd love to say hi or whatever, but like, I don't need to wait in this line. Mm -hmm. Um, And following him on Instagram, I saw like the promotion around the book was really cool. So first of all, I was watching like a, you know, primetime nationally televised basketball game. Like it wasn't a Celtics game. It was like, whatever, but it was, I think it was a TNT game and Mm -hmm. the commentators at halftime, like one of them, I can't remember who that, but they, like they had the book and they're like, Hey, have you read this book? And I was like, Oh, that's cool. Like Kenny, the jet Smith and Charles Barkley. Yeah. 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 Well, this, I mean, it's it would be, they should talk about this. Like this is, you know, and I think, so he also talks a lot about like, uh, his Muslim upbringing. And so there's yeah. like, you know, how that kind of weaves in too. And that definitely is part of basketball culture. You know, there are, you know, religion, I think is really interesting in basketball culture. Like the yeah. Celtics were all very open about their Christianity this year, which, you know, is very interesting. Um, but, look, but there isn't a lot. Wise, there used to be a lot more intellectualism, and I feel like oh. this is the intellectualism that basketball needs to re-embrace. Yeah, totally. Um, but I, the one last promotion thing I wanted to mention was that the Timberwolves. So he's like a huge Timberwolves fan, oh. and they contracted him to do like a promotional, like video for them, like write oh. something original. Yeah, like make an, make a Timberwolves ad for us, basically. Like, and I think that was super cool. That is super cool. Yeah. Like, um, you know, I mean, I get like, and he kind of talks about Spike Lee, you know, Spike Lee was like the, who made basketball intellectual yeah. like in the nineties, you know, especially, um, in the, in black culture and like, you know, really explored it. And he sort of talks about how Spike Lee is, you know, kind of good and bad for black culture. Mm. 
Um, just there's yeah. like definitely, you know, cause he, he spikely directed, he got game. Um, I just, I, if you're a basketball fan, you should read this, like should be mandatory. Right. Because <laughs> I just, I just think like there's so much more to the sport just in the way there is for any sport, but there's so much more to basketball than just like, Oh, millionaires and gold chains. And you know, like, it, yeah, it's like this really, cause I used to play a ton of pickup basketball. And like the whole culture of pickup basketball was super cool. I always really liked it. I loved all the pecking order stuff and the egalitarianism and like anybody can play if you show up with your team and, you know, like, uh, it was very like a lot of respect and, you know, and so I just don't, I don't know if people kind of realize how ingrained it is into some of these, like, especially inner inner city cultures. Did you read Elgin Baylor's memoir? No, people have recommended that to me a number of times. That I love. So I really liked that book. I worked on that book when Houghton Mifflin published it. Right. And what one of the things a, I do we have a copy at camp? Maybe there is a copy at camp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I tried to get Huck to read it. He said he already read it. Um, but Elgin Baylor grew up in D.C. and he talks a lot about um, the pickup scene in D.C. when he was coming up and how that made him so tough. Yeah. And just like because they battled and it was a really physical. Yeah you know, game. And so then when he got to the NBA, it was like that had like trained him to just like be physical and be tough. And yeah, I bet that's I I, actually, that's where I got a lot of my appreciation of black culture was playing pickup basketball and the fans in Boston. Cool. Um, that's interesting. Yeah. It's all right. Is that all of our books? I don't know. That is, that, those were all six of our books. I know. Uh, um, so I actually some crushed, pretty good winners, pretty yeah. good winners. Couple I crushed of one other yeah. book last week that I'm going to save for next time. Cause it doesn't come out till August 6th. Okay. That's so I'll give you a little preview now of hum by Helen Phillips. Hmm. that I'm looking forward to talking about cause I have Great. lots of thoughts. All right. Well, uh, these dog days of summer are, Perfect for reading, um, but and sadly, we will not be on the dock uh, in the near future. Not for an- another few weeks. Not for another few weeks, but first week of August, maybe. See yeah. what happens. All right, everybody. Uh, we have a variety of events, including a Jessica Anthony event coming up in August. So make sure you hit the events tab of the bookshop, beverlyfarms.com, to check all of that out. Uh, make sure you stop into your friendly neighborhood booksellers and buy some books uh, so that we can feel better about going on vacation. And, uh, you know, in general, try to stay cool.